Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing another episode of our Planet Zoom Mod Spotlights. This will be part 61, I believe, and we're going to be having a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making that showcase the animals that we share our wonderful world with. And this has been a lot more of kind of the dream team, Leaf and Buff Zoo making all these aquatic animals, plus if you can see in the back there, some really, really big and wonderful additions. But we're going to be starting off with some small fish. Uh, so our first one, also done by Leaf and Buffsu, we have got the European Perch. So let's have a look at these wonderful guys here. So these guys are known as the Common Perch, or the Redfin Perch, or the Eurasian River Perch, or even just the Perch and their native range. These guys are a predatory fish uh, that are native to Europe and Northern Asia. And they're quite a popular angular fish, so they're quite copy... Uh, common for anglers to try and catch and they've been widely introduced beyond uh, Europe uh, it's been introduced to Australia New Zealand and South Africa which means they can cause some uh, very bad damage to the local ecosystems there and have been actually uh, proclaimed a noxious, a noxious species in New South Wales so these guys as you can see they're kind of greenish white with their reddish fins where they get the name the red fin uh, they have five to eight of these dark bands as you can see going down there and as they get larger a, a hump will grow between its head and its dorsal fin so you can kind of see that. Um, they can vary greatly in size and can live up to 22 years and the older perches tend to be much larger on average with the maximum length for these guys is about 60 centimeters or 24 inches with the British record being 2.8 kilograms or 6 pounds 2 ounces but they grow larger in mainland Europe than they do in Britain. So in 2010, there was actually a really large perch that was eight pounds, four ounces, found uh, caught in the Netherlands, but generally don't get much larger than this. So they're typically between uh, 60, the maximum lens is kind of like 60 centimeters, 24 inches, and maybe up to 3.75 kilograms, 3.75 kilograms, or eight pounds, four ounces. So as I mentioned, their range kind of encompasses the freshwater basins all over Europe, including the Iberian Peninsula, and then also known from Siberia in the east, all through Russia and all of those areas, and also known in the Baltic Sea. They're most abundant in like relatively shallow lakes and waters with deep light penetration, and they're less, uh, less abundant in deep waters with low light penetration, so they do like uh, shallow, more light water. And they've actually been widely introduced, as I mentioned, to Australia and things like that. And they've actually been implicated in the decline of the um, aquarium perch, which is believed to be an endangered native fish from Australia, uh, which um, really sucks because these guys are out competing them. And we always love our native fish, don't we? But as uh, in terms of their uh, behavior, these guys are predatory species with the juveniles feeding on zooplankton, uh, perch fry, and bottom invertebrates. And the adults will feed on in other invertebrates and or, or just more invertebrates and fish. So they mainly feed on sicklebacks, minnows, roach, and perch. And they'll start eating other fish when they're about 120 millimeters long. And they reach sexual maturity about one to two years of old age in males and uh, two to four in uh, females. And in Northern Hemisphere, they will spawn between February and July, uh, depositing their eggs on water plants and in the branches of trees and things, uh, which is pretty cool. And in terms of fishing, they're global uh, game fish and a food fish they're apparently good eating and there's uh baits you'd use minnow goldfish things like that and in terms of predators they are preyed upon by the western osprey cormorants kingfishers uh dalmatian pelicans uh pikes and otters so that's common prey for them but yeah really really wonderful fish and it's really cool to see them in planet zoo done by leaf and buff zoo of course and now we're gonna move on to its kind of american brother or its american cousin we have got here the yellow perch, also known as the American perch, or the uh, percher. So these guys are actually sometimes even considered a subspecies of the uh, Eurasian perch, or the European perch, but these guys are generally now considered their own species. So these guys have these kind of elongate bodies, the main difference is that they don't have the, quite the stripes, they're not quite as reddish, and there's a few other di uh, differences as you can see here. And the maximum length of these guys is slightly smaller, about 50 centimeters, although they are more commonly around 19.1 centimeters, or 7.5 inches. And their maximum weight is 1.9 kilograms, so they're slightly smaller than their um, Eurasian cousins. 
And these guys, as I mentioned, they're kind of their American cousins. So they're found only in North America. They're found in the temperatures of the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans, also the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Rivers, and the Mississippi River Basin. And their native range in Canada also extends uh, throughout Nova Scotia and Quebec into the Mackenzie, Mackenzie River. And in the United States, they extend south into Ohio and Illinois, and they're found mostly in the northeastern United States, such as the Savannah River. And they've even been, uh, there's even been a small native population in Florida, which is pretty cool. And they have been introduced across the place for um, uh, hunting, for obviously people to fish, and also there have been some illegal introductions as well. Though they have been extirpated from some places, such as Arkansas. So in terms of their um, breeding, they turn sexual maturity to about two to three years old in males and three to four in females. And they are Eropaparis, which they spawn annually in the spring when water temperatures are between two and 18 degrees, so 35 to 65 degrees. Uh, spawning uh, Fahrenheit, uh, spawning, they kind of do it communally under the darkness of night. And they're oviviviparous, that means their eggs are uh, fertilely ex uh, fertilized externally and they're laid in kind of this like gelatinous strands where that's kind of unique to a North American freshwater fish where they put it upon weeds and things and usually after they've been laid the eggs will hatch in about 11 to 22 day, uh, 27 days depending on temperature and other factors and um, in the northern water, water, uh, waters they tend to actually be slightly uh, l longer lived and slower growing so females in general grow larger and faster and live longer and mature three to four years compared to a male which males will mature at about two to three years at a smaller size and most researchers considered their maximum age to be nine to ten years with up to 11 years sometimes and yeah i'm really cool fish um as i mentioned they kind of got their geographic distribution with like some introduced in some areas and things like that in terms of the ecology it's not too different from the european perch they eat zooplankton when they're young and then they'll uh, as they get bigger they'll switch to things like macro invertebrates and large adults will feed on invertebrates uh, craw crawfish fish eggs juvenile fish and they've actually been known to be primarily piscivorous and even cannibalistic in some cases so that's pretty interesting and they actually um are preyed upon by other fish as well such as northern pike uh, muscalunge sunfish water eye trout and yellow perch are predators of these guys so they're kind of a meso predator or kind of midway in the ecosystem they've also eaten in america by cormorants diving ducks loons herons white pelicans and also i believe otters and in canada they get affected by a lot of the diseases that um, salmon get so yeah in terms of their habitat they, and their like social habits, they tend to live in large schools uh, and they will form these schools in the spring and kind of find them in these shallow areas where they'll find a nest and they can spawn potentially up to eight times in their lifetime. And the female will deposit her egg mass and then the males will kind of fight over it with no parental care and then the babies will hang out as I mentioned on there and do that. Hang out on the... Uh, they lay them kind of on any weeds and stuff and then they hatch after 11 to 27 days all that so really kind of explain that and just like their relative they are quite a common recreational angular fish or even a sport fish and they actually are delicious apparently uh, but they are some good baits include like minnows worms clams things like that but there are some populations have been affected by intensive harvesting so there's lots of regulations and stuff around that also there's been some efforts to try and uh, bring them into aquaculture which seems to be doing quite well so it helps refresh wild populations so yeah really really cool guys a really nice perch and uh, also done by leaf and buff suit how can you not love them so next we're going to be moving on to the brook trout so we got another trout uh wonderful guy here so these guys are a type of char in the char genus of salmon. So look at these wonderful guys here. So these guys are native to eastern North America, to the United States and Canada, but have been introduced elsewhere in North America, as well as Iceland, Europe and Asia, interestingly. They're also known as the spectacled, uh, speckled trout or the mud trout or the coaster trout. Uh, which is referring to a uh, adrogynous population that lives in Maine. That means they don't really need to go out to the water. And then uh, state fish in a few states such as New Jersey, New York, uh, Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Michigan. And also the provincial fish of Nova Scotia and Canada. 
So these guys are really interesting. Uh, there's some subspecies and things like that. The silver trout is extinct and was believed to be last seen in 1930s. Uh, but luckily the general they're considered secure by the nature service so they're quite common. You can see the book trouts are like dark green to brown colors with like this distinct marble patterning as you can see here where they get that kind of that spectacle uh, salmon name from. And typical lengths for these guys uh, range between 25 and 65 centimeters or 9.8 to 25.6 inches and weigh between 0.3 and 3 kilograms or 0.66 to 6.61 pounds with a maximum recorded length of 86 centimeters or 34 inches and 66 6.6 kilograms just 6.6 kilograms or 15 pounds i think someone's escaped Hello? yeah he's escaped yeah this annoys me they kind of get out of there sometimes that's a sneak peek of what's coming but we'll keep talking about the trout because who doesn't love the trout so yeah, carry on with that. Um, these guys are native to a wide range of eastern North America, which includes the Appalachian Mountains, the Hudson Bay, uh, Great Lakes, kind of similar areas to the Yellow Perch. And they have been introduced to other areas such as uh, the eastern US, also Argentina and New Zealand, uh, but it seems like there hasn't been uh, too many. Uh, there's been some that are successful, but others are not in terms of reintroductions. Uh, so these guys typically live in large or small lakes, rivers, creeks, and ponds and things. They usually like waters that are really pure and have a low pH and are, and are sensitive to poor oxygen uh, pollution and um, changes in pH, such as acid rain. And they typically like to live in water temperatures between 34 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit or 1 to 22 degrees Celsius. And the warm separate temperatures and low flows are stressful on these uh, trouts, especially with um, larger fish. In terms of their diet, they are very, very generalist. They'll feed on, especially as babies, they'll feed on insects or aquatic insects such as stoneflies, mayflies, things like that. And adult forms on terrestrial insects that are grasshoppers, beetles, ants, and they even feed in crustaceans, frogs, uh, and other amphibians, mollusks, smaller fish, even small mammals such as voles can be potential prey for these guys. So. Similar to other species of trout, they'll form a depression in the stream bed, which is called a red, where the groundwater will come up through the gravel. And once one or more males approach, the females will kind of expel her eggs, and the males will try their best to fertilize as many of them as possible. And even though there's most likely a lot of these eggs will be canalized as well, and the eggs are slightly denser than water, so the female then buries them in this mound, and they hatch after about 95 to 100 days. And as we mentioned, they're quite a common angular fish, and there are some records, like some quite big ones. But generally, like a lot of angular fish, they, there's records and things like that. It's a very, very common pastime. Really look, beautiful looking fish as well. And they are being raised in aquaculture for food, but they've also been, obviously, they do not raise them to release them generally, but they have been raised for food, so it doesn't really affect the wild population too much. And in terms of their conservation status, they have been extirpated from some areas because of water developments and things like that, and also um, affected by other fish introductions. But generally they are doing okay, and as I mentioned, they are invasive. They are found in Yellowstone, which sucks. And there have been other areas where they've been introduced, like New Zealand, Australia, things like that. They're still really wonderful fish, and I think they're doing rather well, and I think they're rather cool. Uh, another one done by Leaf and Buffsu. And next, we've got another... We had the Silver Arowana last time. This time, we have got the Black Arowana. So, really wonderful guy here. So, this is the Black Arowana, which is a South American bony fish, related to, obviously, the Silver Arowana. These guys are sometimes kept in aquariums like their relatives, but they need a big tank as they also refer to as monkey fish. So these guys are native to tropical South America and restricted to the Rio Negro for uh, basins, including the Prado River. And they've actually been discovered in the Orinoco basins in the 1970s, but we don't know if it's a natural population or people have introduced them by accident. And they actually are a non-migratory species that live in black water which is uh, during the dry season they mostly live in these areas but they often be found in flooded forests in the wet season. So these guys reach a maximum length of about 0.9 meters or 3 feet and uh, there has been reports of individuals that get up to 1.2 meters or 3.9 feet 
with juveniles having black and yellow markings along the left of the body, and then you can see these large adults. And in contrast to juveniles, uh, adults are actually very similar to silver arowanas. Uh, so you can see they're not too different from each other. They're just kind of like the different colors in terms of looks. And in terms of behavior, similar to the other arowana, they're kind of called monkey fish or water monkey because they are known to jump out of the water, which can be a very bad thing for aquaculturists because if you have one in an aquarium and it jumps up the tank, it usually lands on your ground and it dies. And it's a very, very common thing to happen and it's very sad, unfortunately. But they often will look at the surface looking for food. They'll feed on anything on the water surface, such as even be known to eat like small monkeys and small bats. But their main diet includes shrimps, insects, smaller fish, uh, other animals that float on the water surface. And they use this kind of uh, drawbridge mouth type uh, mouth that they use to kind of suck everything in, which is pretty cool. And these guys typically breed during the high water season or during the wet season. Uh, they can have up to 210 eggs and are mouth brooders. So the male will have the eggs in his mouth and the young only are fully released from their mouth when they're about 7 centimeters long or 2.8 inches. So these guys are pretty good dads. So that's pretty cool. Another one done by Leaf and Buff Sue. But now I've got one done by uh, Leaf and Rick Modding. So it kind of breaks it up. But we've got some really cool animals here. We have got the chain cat shark or the chain dogfish so really cool little guy here isn't he adorable so these guys are actually a small cat shark that are biofluorescent which is very interesting and they're very similar to the small spotted cat shark so these guys are found in the northwestern atlantic so to the gulf of mexico and caribbean as well they range from massachusetts to barbados and in the mid-atlantic break they can be found across the outer continental shelf and they typically live at depths between three, uh, 36 and 750 meters, or 1,118 to 2,461 feet. And it kind of ranges, depends where they are. And they typically like to live in water temperatures that are between 8.5 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Celsius, or 47 degrees Fahrenheit and 57 degrees Fahrenheit. So they kind of like their range. Uh, these guys spend their daytime resting on the bottom, usually uh, in contact with surfaces. And the bottom rubble, they can use the camouflage as well. They'll have been observed living in amenities, tunnels, and tubes like that. Uh, they also tend to prefer rock, rock bottoms uh, as adults, which creates a difficulty for trawl sampling. And while the immature forms tend to live near smoother regions. And in Aquaria, they're actually relatively motionless. So they spend the day resting at the bottom. And, and during the night when they come out to feed, they tend to become very active. So these guys are obviously not the largest of sharks. The maximum body length is about 59 centimeters or 1.94 feet, so nearly two feet long. And in female, the follicle develop uh, is correlated with the neandemal gland size. So that means they have considered mature when they have a full neidomenal gland. And the uh, glands can be growth by 1.8 centimeters or more. And sexual maturity is usually seen in a female that's about 52 centimeters long or 1.71 feet. And there's also been uh, evidence to show that some northern populations may be smaller sizes. It just depends. There is some variation within their range. Also, they've been observed mating. So they, these guys like to play it a little rough. They like to bite each other and all that. Let's see if you can find the other one. There's maybe the three in here. I'll have a look at this one. So they do like to be a little bit more uh, adventurous with their... What's the word? Adventurous. <laughs> they do like biting each other and they usually, the male will bite the female so they can have a firm grip so they can copulate properly. Oh, there's another one. I don't like these uh, animals. They're kind of annoying. Uh, kind of annoys me. So, here we are. Let's go back here. So there's some eating. So... These guys actually prefer virtual structures, uh, vertical structures for, to deposit their eggs after they've bred. So they deposit their eggs in pairs. Uh, and the interval between these pair of eggs can be a minimum between eight days or a few minutes. And they usually develop, uh, development ranges about one millimeter diameter for, per 7.7 .7 days. Although temperature does affect that. And these guys lay eggs. They have the female cat shark is able to sport, source sperm inside her and lay eggs several days after the copulation. And they've been known to store sperm for up to 843 days uh, if like the conditions are not good. And they often lay them on the vertical structures I mentioned. And you can kind of they take about eight to twelve months to develop. 
uh, due to temperature variations in the water and you can kind of measure it and it's really really cool and a little side note about their fluorescence as we mentioned so they're one of the four species of shark that are shown to possess below fluorescent properties so they actually have been looked and they kind of like a snake eye cam uh, shark eye camera so they're able to see this uh, biofluorescence which is believed to be an adaption to be contrast with the surroundings so that means that they could pretty much use these pigments to try and contrast each other it could be to communicate or whatever it is it's really interesting and these guys are not currently fished and they've been described as gorgeous sharks which i do agree i think they're rather cute and they're a pretty popular cold water aquarium fish and they've been frequently displayed and bred in public aquariums and a lot of research has been done into these guys to keep them in laboratories and aquariums and things like that so yeah they're really really wonderful fish if i do say so myself really really beautiful so now we're going to move it on that was done by leaf and rick modding now we've got another one done by leaf and buff Sue. We've got something a little bigger this time. We have got the Atlantic Tarpan. So these guys are raven fish that live in coastal waters, estuaries, lagoons and rivers, also known as the uh, Silver King. Uh, and have been reported as far north as Nova Scotia and to the Atlantic coast and as far south as Argentina. So they've got quite a wide range, if it's don't say so myself. And these guys are actually evolved 18 million years ago and one of the oldest living fish species. They've been get quite large. They've been recorded to be up to 2.5 meters or 8 feet 2 inches long and weigh up to 161 kilograms or 355 pounds. The males typically weigh no more than uh, 100 pounds. So the males are kind of smaller. The big, it's the big ones of the females. They also are capable of filling their swim bladder with air like a lung, which gives them an uh, advantage when oxygen levels are low in the water. So that's also very interesting. And these guys, their most significant predators include humans and sharks. And their diet changes throughout their life. So juveniles will feed on zooplankton and small prey. And adults will feed on other fish, shrimp and crabs. Which is pretty cool. Their relationship to humans, they've actually the scales were used as nail files and decorative purposes since prehistory. And actually in, also the scales have also been used for traditional medicines. This is really cool, but they're also considered a quite common game fish because they are very acrobatic, they're very good jumpers, and they're also very strong, so it's kind of a, gives you that thrill of the hunt, and they're really, really cool fish to uh, try and fish, I've heard. Really, really wonderful animals, uh, if I do say so myself. But these guys, since they're not really commercially valuable, there's not been documented on their migrations and things, but it seems that they have a very wide range. Uh, they're highly migratory and they often cross international borders, which makes it hard to conserve them. But we know pretty much they live from Nova Scotia down to like Argentina, so they live pretty much all over the Atlantic Ocean, as we think so. And they have been, uh, they often migrated from the Panama Canal to the Atlantic and the Pacific and back from 80 years. So we know that's a uh, very common migration. And they also are opportunistic feeders. They're quite, they prefer waters between 22 and 28 degrees Celsius or 72 to 82, below 16 degrees Celsius or 61 degrees Fahrenheit. They become inactive and they can die in water under four degrees. So they are quite sensitive to those things, but luckily there's a lot of ocean at their temperatures. But yeah, some really wonderful fish. And Leaf and Buff Sue, again, have done a wonderful job with these guys. So next we're gonna be moving on to another cool little fish here we have got the port jackson shark really one of my favorites here done by leaf and rick modding again so these guys the port jackson shark are a nocturnal over vi uh, viviparous or oviparous uh bull he bullhead shark from the family heterodontidae which are found in coastal regions of southern australia including the waters of port jackson hence the name the port jackson shark so these guys are typically endemic to the temperate waters across southern Australia, that they can be found in Queensland, south and Tasmania, and western Australia. And there's also been uh, believed to be a population off the coast of New Zealand, uh, which is pretty cool, with a few specimens found over there. And these guys typically live at the bottom of the ocean. They are typically uh, bottom feeders, so they tend to hang around the bottom. So they prefer like sandy or muddy um Waters, all, all those seagrass beds are also quite common. Though during the day, they, when they're not usually active, they can be found in areas with shelter that includes caves and things. 
or in rocky outcrops, but during they prefer these sandy and muddy body bottoms to try and find food. So these guys are nocturnal species and their activity peaks during the late evening hours and decrease before sunrise, which has been seen in captive wild individuals. And it's really, really cool. And they actually have an annual migration to breed in coastal um, embays with males arriving first at the harbors across Australia's coastline. And the females will arrive and uh, they'll, and they stay later to protect the eggs potentially. And they actually both so um, phylopathy and high site fidelity, so that means they'll often come back to their sites. Um, and Port Jacksons, in terms of their appearance, they can grow up to 1.65 meters or 5.5 uh, feet long. They're similar to others in their genus, uh, not too different. And they have these really easy identical teeth. They've got this like bull head, where they get the name bullhead shark, with this bottom mouth. They're not like your great whites that use it to feed and filter. Well, not really filter, but rummage through sand or mud to try and find uh, prey for them, which is specially adapted for them. They eat specifically mollusks and things like that. And um, in terms of their respiratory system, they have five gills, uh, similar to a lot of other sharks, and they're able to pump water through their um, gills and actually have the ability to eat and breathe at the same time because most sharks usually need to swim with their mouths open to force water through their gills, but they can pump water through their gills to obviously breathe uh, and sit and relax at the same time. So that's pretty cool. So male Port Jackson sharks become sexually mature between 8 and 10 years old and females 11 to 14. They are oviparous, which means they lay eggs rather than give live birth. And they have a breeding cycle which begins in late August and continues to the middle of November. During this time they lay a pair of eggs every 8 to 70 days, as many as 8, pair, eight pairs of eggs can be laid during these days. And the eggs mature at about 10 to 11 months before they are hatchlings. And they can break out of the egg capsule, so pretty much the next year. And it's also been assessed by recent studies that they have an 81.9% mortality rate, which is mostly from predators. So in terms of also di digestion, it takes a, lot lo a long time in these sharks, and even compared to other sharks or mammals, they seem to take a little while, especially since they eat a lot of things that are um, like sea urchins, crustaceans, fishes and that. Uh, they're actually very different from other sharks in that regard, with their teeth, they're not serrated, the name means their genus heterodontus, which means different tooth. And it kind of um, is differently adapted to allow them to crush and break through the shells of mollusks and echinoderms and things like that, rather than eat a lot of soft-shelled prey. In terms of learning, they've actually been seen resting in caves, and they uh, percent to associate sarks based on sex and age. And they, on the other hand, do not seem to be social though, so they can recognize other sharks but are not social. And they actually have pretty unique personality traits with others. Uh, some do, some are more bold, some are more um, reserved, just like a lot of uh, other animals, it's not too different. But they've actually been, been capable of learning to um, associate bubbles, LED lights or sounds with the rewards, so that you can positively train them. So that's things really, really awesome. And in terms of their relations to humans, it's not really a big issue, it's, but they can be vulnerable to bycatch and they can be kind of vulnerable to things like that and obviously climate change but there was actually a man bought by a port a bit by a port jackson shark named album and the bite did not pierce his skin and was able to swim away with the shark latched onto his calf so he's doing quite well now and they are luckily considered least concerned but they are really do experience those high mortality rates because of predators but they seem to be doing pretty well regardless uh the climate change obviously can put a spanner in that but really really wonderful fish but, and I'm really happy these guys came out so well. So that's another one done by Leaf and Rick Modding. And now we've got our big uh, last animals. We've got our whales here. So we're going to be having a look. This one was done by Leaf and Buff Sue as well. We've got everyone's favorite uh, big uh, marine mammals. We have got here the sperm whale. Might just have to wait for them to go for a swim. Uh, but that won't take long. We'll have a look at this female while he goes and sorts himself out. So these guys are the sperm whale or the carolot, which are the largest uh, species of toothed whale and also the largest toothed predator known. And the only living member of its genus Physeter, and are one of the three living members of the sperm whale family, which includes the pygmy um, sperm whale, which we covered before, and the dwarf sperm whale. These guys are pelagic mammals, so they live in open water and they live worldwide. You can find them from the Arctic to Antarctica. And um, 
but the females will typically live females in their pots with their babies will typically live in more temperate waters but the more extreme waters so up in the high north and the high, low south they will be typically um be big bulls that's where they typically live uh with the males living solitary during the breeding season while the females live in pods to protect their young and females give birth every four to twenty years and take care of their calves for more of a decade so very very slow breeding animals but once they get big enough they have few natural predators they only can be killed by orcas and people which is uh kind of sucks but really interesting so mature males in terms of their size they are average between 16 centimeter uh, not centimeters 16 meters or 52 feet in length but some big males can get up to 20 meters or 68 feet with their large head representing about uh, a third of their body length and females i believe get about uh, 11 meters uh yeah 11 meters 36 feet and get about 14 tons while males at 16 to 20 meters and get up to like 41 to potentially even 60 tons with a newborn being four meters and a single ton so that's pretty interesting so that's a lot uh, let's have a look at you you're going a bit fast i'm trying to keep up with you really really wonderful animals though so um they are also one of the deepest diving uh mammals the third deepest diving after the southern elephant seal and the cuvier's beaked whale it's very possible that they could be much deeper divers than that we just haven't recorded it and they use echolocation and vocalizations to see through the water and they can use up to uh they actually have the loudest sounds produced by any animal and that could be 230 decibels for comparison that's pretty much a uh, jet taking off so that's very very powerful and they actually have the largest brain of any uh animal on earth that's more time five times heavier than a human brain and they can live up to 70 years or more so really really wonderful animals if you do say so so I believe the largest animal that has been weighed was about 18 me uh, meters long or 59 feet and weighed 53 tons. And there have been kind of variations. The largest estimates have potentially been up to 20 meters and 80 tons. So really, really big animals. And the longest, there have even been reports of animals up to 24 meters, but uh, they kind of, we haven't really seen that. But extensive whaling has made decrease their size. The big individuals were the one that were hunted the most as that might really help them. But yeah we know a lot about these guys they have these uh teeth here uh males typically have these big teeth because they use them to uh fight other bulls so they'll rake each other and also it's been used to sort of eat squids since their typical diet is uh squid including giants and colossal squids which they've been seen getting into fights with with like lots of scars on their face along with rakings of other whales so what happens is that these guys will dive down to these depths they have this very special uh large th spermaceti organ which takes up a lot of their large head here and that allows them it's actually really cool because it's an oil they can kind of use it to take all the blood out of it and that makes it hard and allows them to sink but then they pump blood into it and then allows them to rise up faster so i think that's really really interesting uh, to be honest uh, let's find the female let's talk about the females where is she? There she is. Oh, I want to get. It's not. It's not very, very hard to grab sometimes. It's Oliver. There we are. So there's a female. So um, the spermaceti organ kind of works is that it kind of also amplifies their sounds as well. It's a very multi-use organ. It's part of the reason why they're able to do so well and produce these big sounds. Really, really cool and as we mentioned they have these large brains that they can use obviously they're very social animals that they can what their brains weigh up to about eight kilograms which is pretty big and they actually have this larger cerebellum uh, in terms of uh, all mammals so pretty big brains very smart and another thing they have is that they're able to collect uh, lots of oxygen in their muscles so that's why they have quite dark muscles they're able to collect it in their muscles so once they dive they can decompress properly so a lot of the oxygen is stored in their muscles rather than their lungs because they kind of get squished by the intense pressure of the ocean and um yeah they also use they also make these sounds they have these monkey lips which are really at the front here next to their nostrils or their nostril it's always on their left side i believe 
and they can use it to clap to produce these clicks that they use to communicate they have complex languages they have some to use and it's even been speculated they could potentially use their uh, louder claps or louder clicks as like a sonic weapon to kind of stun prey which is also very interesting so in terms of their social life um, these guys will the males as I mentioned will kind of live by themselves and the females live in these pods with their females and offspring and um, they'll often start to breed at about nine years old with the oldest fe uh, pregnant female being recorded at 40, 41 years old so the gestation is quite long so it requires 14 to 16 months to have a calf and these guys will produce uh, milk for about 12, uh, 19 to 42 months uh, and calves may suckle up to about 13 years old so imagine that if that happened today and <laughs> humans that'd be very awkward and also like other whales they have very uh they have higher fat contents than a lot of other mammals so these guys have about 36 percent fat compared to a cow milk's four percent fat so that means it's basically drinking cottage cheese so that's kind of a very interesting comparison and they allow to suckle all from females other than their mothers so they will often group as a group they will take care of babies so lactating females will also uh let other babies suckle that's not theirs and males generally they'll become sexually mature at about 18 years old and upon these maturities they tend to move away from their females and move up to the higher latitudes with the other big bulls uh, and they t uh, females will typically stay around these lower latitudes and raise their other babies and they will reach their full size at about 50 years old so relationships with other species include um, they'll feed on giant and colossal squids they get lots of scars from them they generally just feed on soft-bodied prey but they are pretty generalist in that extent but they use suction feeding to suck their uh, prey into their mouth um, really really interesting and their relationship with humans is a very very sad one so during whaling this was the species that was pretty much hunted the most by whaling because they wanted to um, Pretty much take all the spermaceti or the oil from their head which was used for cosmetics and candles and things like that uh, but uh, they largely weren't too heavily affected by whaling apparently though they were the main species i believe the uh, highest populations the highest catch was like about 250,000 in uh, a couple decades so there was lots and lots of them and i believe their modern populations is believed to be about 236,000. oh wait no 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 that's wrong their population is between like all of um all of whaling in the 20th century there were believed to be 770,000 uh sperm whales taken between 1946 and 1980 most of them were but there were other obviously whales taken in that time so that's a lot of whales but um there's still a lot of large populations that are considered vulnerable rather than endangered and there are whaling for these guys has been gone for pretty much like uh, half a century now so it's illegal to hunt these guys and plus a lot of people just don't have the ability to because uh, this requires a lot of specialized equipment but luckily they are protected now and uh, their populations are recovering but um, there's also issues such as climate change things like that also plastic weights they've been remains of sperm whales that have like tons and tons of plastics in their um, stomachs because they think it's like a squid uh, but yeah um, really wonderful whale how can you not love a wonderful sperm whale really cool guys so now we're gonna move on to our last animal here also done by Leaf and Buffsu we've got another whale we have got the humpback whale so arguably another one of the really famous whales so we have got these wonderful guys here so these guys are a species of rock wild whale and one of the larger ones and they typically range between uh 14 to 15 cent uh not centimeters I keep saying that uh 15 meters so 49 to 46 feet though they have been recorded to be larger about 16 to 17 so 52 to 56 feet with females using usually being a little bit larger than the males and females uh, well this species they also get to about 40 metric tons so they're quite large not the larger for the whales but definitely on the larger side and calves are usually born at uh, 4.3 meters or 14 feet long and about 680 kilograms so a little under a ton and they have this really charismatic shape to them they have these um, long rostrums and long body they also have these very large fins these uh, pectoral fins and um, they often have been used, I believe they've actually been used to try and, uh, they've been modeled off like, uh, 
wind turbines and things like that been modeling off these to try and get as efficient as possible but they have these really large um, flippers that they use they actually use them a lot to uh, hurt prey and things not the hurt prey but hurt predators so like orcas and things will they will often try to um, hit them with their flippers which is very interesting and they also actually have um, about 270 to 400 plates of baleen, which is like this little hairy substance that you see in here that they use to filter food. So similar to other rockwall whales, what they'll do is they will open their mouths and let the water go in and then they'll filter out any small fish and things like that. And um, they typically live in groups and aggregations, things like that. And they've actually been known to be like really um, play a lot with other species such as bottlenose dolphins, right whales and fin whales. And they often have the one that you often see breaching in the pictures. They quite uh, breach quite commonly. And in terms of their diet, they're pretty generalist. They'll feed on krill and small uh, schooling fish. But so mainly they'll eat like krill, uh, other small fish. And they're very famous for using bubble feeding. So a group of them will kind of create a bubble net from their blowing bubbles around their prey. And then they'll all come up and trap them and go grab their food. It's seen on almost every nature documentary. Really, really awesome. So in terms of their breeding, it kind of takes place during the winter months where they move up to the uh, tropics and they're quite promiscuous so they'll have multiple partners and um, gestation is about 11 and a half months for these guys and females will reproduce every two years and humpback whale births have actually really been observed and it's usually quite quick and they can suckle for up to a year but are independent from six months old and humpbacks uh, reach five to ten years, uh, take about five to ten years to reach maturity, uh, that just depends on the population. So also that's another thing that's really famous about these guys is their vocalizations. So they're very famous for their singing. Uh, the males will typically have these really, really loud songs to try and attract females and even suggest that they have kind of different dialects for different local populations, uh, which is also very interesting. And um, in terms of predation, they typically are only uh, preyed upon by uh, orcas, but they often will actually uh, protect other animals like seals from orcas. They are kind of like the guardians of the ocean in that way, as they'll kind of uh, keep orcas away and protect other animals. They're quite, um, what's that, altruistic is the word. Yeah, that's the word. So now in terms of their range, they're pretty much found all over the world. They're found from the, top, uh, the Arctic to Antarctica. And there are some subspecies with different ranges. There's some different breeding stocks. Like they'd be found around like, um, they kind of breed around like uh, tropic islands, uh, things like that. And then during the winter, typically the males and they'll all go down south where it's warmer and will eat all the krill that they can get. So that's really interesting. And this was another species that was very badly hit by whaling. And some populations got really low. Uh, it's believed that over the 20th century, about 200,000 humpback whales were taken from the southern hemisphere. And the North Atlantic population is believed to have dropped as low as 700 whales. Uh, but luckily, they have been growing up quite um, well, which is really, really cool. They considered least concern now with a worldwide population of about 135,000, with about 84,000 mature individuals, and it's trending upwards. So they're a really, really great conservation story since whaling was um, cancelled. And there's, um, the pre-whaling population was estimated to be 125,000, so it's believed they may actually be doing better, uh, at least now, than they were before, so that's also very good. And local populations include about 13,000 in the North Atlantic, 21,000 North Pacific, and 80,000 in the Southern Hemisphere. But they are, some populations are considered endangered locally, but they are on an upward trend. So that's very, very good and another really good way to show that they're doing well. Though there are some problems they still face, such as poisoning, getting entangled in gear, getting hit by boats, uh, coastal degradation as well, excessive noise, climate change are another big issues for these guys as well. But luckily, they have been doing quite well, and you can often go whale watching. They're kind of that big draw. They're really, really charismatic whales. They'll jump up and do all those things for you, and really, really cool animals. So yeah, I'm a big fan of these humpback whales, and Leaf and Buffs, you did a wonderful job bringing these animals to us. So yeah, nice to see some whales for a change. Obviously, you won't see them in zoos in real life, but it's really cool that I get an opportunity to talk about them. And I believe these models actually came from Beyond Blue. So yeah, really awesome to see those guys coming. And we've got more whales coming in the future. So I'm quite excited to talk about them. So yeah. I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. 
Always remember to tell a little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye